Sermon number 10 in this series, this series from the book of James. I've enjoyed having a, a summer to look at one book of the Bible. And I pray that it's blessed you with James's street level Christianity, if you will. We may next week in the sermon you'll listen to, I'm still working with it. I think we're going to touch on the final two verses of James. So I'll say we're wrapping it up today, but I think we're going to visit it a little bit next week. We'll see how that develops this week. I want to share an opening prayer. It comes from 1854. I love prayers from previous centuries. They pray differently than I pray. And they broaden and deepen the way I pray. So this prayer, we pray. Father, teach me that you are always near. Teach me the struggles of the soul to bear, to check the rising doubt, the rebel sigh. Teach me the patience of an unanswered prayer, O Spirit of God. Amen. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Praying for patience. Patience. So much of our life is spent waiting, and it's often there in waiting that our patience is tested. Where do you find it the hardest to be patient? With people, with work, with health, with traffic lights. <laughs> Indeed, patience does not come by easily. This little ditty, maybe you've heard it. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can found seldom in a woman, never in a man. <laughs> Our world is speeding up. In 1900, it took three weeks to get a letter. Three weeks. In 1940, they came out in movie theater with highlight reels. For those of you much younger, you would go to a theater to catch global highlights. It wasn't on the news. 1950, letters now were delivered in seven days. During World War II in the 40s, when my dad was in Italy and Africa, he would write letters to my mom, and it would require anywhere from one to four weeks to get into her hand. 1980, video cameras. 1990, overnight express mail. And it cost a bundle. 1992, the first text message. 1995, email. And yet, as fast as we are at communication now, I just sense that we become even more impatient. Did you get my email yesterday? How come you didn't answer? Did you get my text today? I haven't heard from you. Impatience. And so James has some valuable advice for anybody here who has what I'll call a patience disorder. Six times, in this small book, six times James uses the word patience. And he'll teach us three, three basic truths. One, when to be patient, why we should be patient and can be patient, and then finally how. How to be patient. So let's take a look. Number one. When to be patient. There are times when patience is not only a must, it's about the only thing we can do. Such as when life, when circumstances are the first fill in the blank, uncontrollable. There's a lot in life that you and I don't have control of. We can't be on top of everything. If you doubt that, just ask a farmer. Take a look at James 5, 7. Would you read it with me, please? 
Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rain. Do not go into farming if you lack patience. The job description of a farmer is wait. You wait until the ground is ready to be tilled from the harsh winter. Then you wait that it's, it's, it's soft enough but not too soft to plant. And then there's waiting to cultivate it. And then there's waiting for the plants to grow. And then there's waiting to harvest it. This is just a list of what he has control over. But the farmer has no control over the weather. No control on the price of milk and the economy. Like the farmer, James reminds us that we need to be patient when circumstances in your life are beyond your control. But he also says you've got to be patient. The second fill in the blank. We need to be patient when people are unchangeable, when people are uncooperative. Who are you thinking of right now? Don't, no elbows. Who's the unchangeable one? Who's the uncooperative one? That no matter what you say, they don't change. And this is why I think James focuses now not on farming, but on the prophets. A prophet was sent by God to call people to change, but so often the people they spoke to refused, they resisted, they were stubborn. Read with me James 5.10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Who is there in your life that is unwilling to change? And they frustrate you so. (laughs) Come on, stop it. James says, have patience. Now, please, patience by James doesn't mean just sitting back passively and tolerating it. Rather, for James, patience is the refusal to quit, the refusal to give up, being what God calls you to be in that person's life. In the Greek, the original language, the word patience has two words, makrothumis, long fuse, long fuse. Who is there in your life that God is saying, I want you to have a long fuse? Because that's how God is with you. If you understand how patient God is with you, to the extent of that, the cross, do you really think it's okay for us to be impatient with our neighbor because of the way he treats his yard? Or something rather small like that? James teaches us to be patient when things are uncontrollable and people are unchangeable, the third blank, and when problems in life are unexplainable. James 5.11, read it with me, please. Behold, we consider those blessed to remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job. You've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Job, what do you know about him? He was in the Super Bowl of suffering. And what made it most difficult, he had no clue why. God considered him the most righteous man on the earth. Why was he going through this? But Job, the the Bible Bible verse we just looked at, Job was steadfast. Another word for steadfast is he persevered. I would not call Job patient. I hear people say, oh, the patience of Job, and I say, yeah, tell me about it. He chewed God out. He yelled at God. You owe me. Come down here right now. But what Job was strong in is he persevered. Being patient has a lot to do with me, with people. Persevere has a lot to do with stuff, life. Job persevered. Job was steadfast. His wife said to him at one point, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Job never cursed God, meaning he never rejected him. 
He never walked away from God. That's the amazing thing. He remained patient in that sense with God that he didn't curse him. He didn't reject him. Instead, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that on the last day he will stand there and I will see him not as a stranger, but as my Redeemer. The one who comes to me in mercy and in justice and makes everything right. If Job could say that without knowing of the cross and the empty tomb, how much more so you and me? We've been there at the cross. We've seen the empty tomb. We, of all people, can persevere and be patient when we see the kind of God we have. Then then James raises this question, why? Not just when be patient, but why be patient? And the next blank, why be patient? Because God is near you. I wish I'd put another blank there. It would read this way. Because God is near and he's in control. James 5, 8, would you read it with me? You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's no small thing, dear ones, that three times in this section, James says, the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming. The Lord's coming back. He's in control. He's sovereign. We focus so much of our faith on the first coming, on Christmas. We focus so much of our faith on the resurrected Jesus who walks with us and talks with us and tells me I am his own. And I'm not making fun of that song. But we love the Christ who's with us. But the Bible focuses much of its attention on the Christ sitting on the throne, and he's coming back. And he's going to make everything right. He's going to come back as the judge. He's going to come back as the the Lord of righteousness and justice, and he will make everything right. Because God is in control of history. Take the word history and make two words of it. His story. God's in control of the world's story. God is in control of your story. He's in control of your story. And that's why we can be patient. Because God is in control of history. My history, your history. He's got it all planned out. There's a phrase I I, I read a long time ago, and I keep going back to it. It gives me some comfort when I get impatient with God. God is never late. Rarely is he ever early. (laughs) But he's never late. And how he acts in your life. James 5, 8, what we read a minute ago, you be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I love the Phillips translation. It's an old translation, and it's not on on, on screen, but just listen. Rest your hearts on this ultimate certainty. His coming is very near. I never forgot when I was in eighth grade, we always tried to stump the pastor. And a bunch of us smart eighth, ninth graders went up to the pastor and we said, do you think God's coming back soon? And he looked at us, I'll never forget his answer. He said, I hope so. (laughs) we just shut up I hope so dear ones if you remember nothing else from this sermon here's where I find my strength God not only knows your future he's in that future already if you're anxious about tomorrow God says "Gosh, I'm there already I'll see you when you come in He's there. He says, don't be afraid. I'm here already. And that's why we can be be patient. But also, look at letter B. God, we can be patient because God blesses the patient. James 5.11, would you read it with me, please? Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. God blesses those who don't quit. Job was blessed in the end with wealth, with family again. 
But he was also blessed by the affirmation of God, where he said to Job's critics, you ought to ask Job to pray for you. Job's a good guy. Dear ones, God's delay in your life does not mean God's denial in your life. Remember, just when Job thought God had forgotten him, what was God actually up to? He was honoring him. This whole thing that God allowed in Job's life was a way of honoring Job. In every single circumstance of your life, God is working. That's not just wishful Pollyanna thinking. That's God's promise. Look at Romans 8.28. Read it with me. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things, not some things, all things do what? They work together for good. It does not say all things work out. That's different. All things work together for good in his eyes, according to his purpose. You may not see it as good, but in God's eyes, he knows better. When Joseph was sold into his slavery and his brothers finally came on the scene and realized the power he was in, they were afraid that he would punish them. And remember what he said to them? You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Where in your life has something gone on that you did not consider good, but hindsight, looking back, you think, God knew what he was doing. And finally... Finally, James raises the question, how are we then to be patient? What am I supposed to do while I'm waiting for God? Or is it, as Dr. Seuss says, a useless place, this waiting place? James would say, Dr. Seuss there is wrong. It's not useless. He would say, James, letter A, wait in expectation. Wait in expectation. James 5, 7, read it with me, please. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. The farmer waits expectantly for the harvest, believing that the harvest is inevitable, it's certain. This is why Abraham was able to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Before he went up to the mount, he said to the servants, you stay here while my boy and I go up to worship. Remember the next line? And when we have finished, we will return to you. He's going up to kill his kid. But there's an expectation that if God makes him go that full extent, that somehow he will raise up the son. Abraham waited expectantly. Then there's poor Noah. It is anticipated, it is expected or guessed, that it took hundreds of years from Noah to build that ark. Have any of you seen the, the ark at the Creation Museum? Hundreds of years, people laughing at him. But Noah waited expectantly for the first drops of rain to fall. James would say we should wait expectantly because what God promises, he delivers Isaiah 49, 23, then you'll know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me will not be put to shame. You won't be embarrassed. James also says we should wait in quiet hope. I love Lamentations 3. It's good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. What does it mean to wait quietly? Don't become anxious and cranky when you wait. Andy doesn't always like going out to eat with me if I have to wait too long for the menu, the dinner, the bill. I get a little cranky. What makes you cranky and waiting? What makes you anxious? This is where James would say, take a look there, James 5, don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you might not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. 
Remember what I said to you a few weeks ago in this series, James 1. Blessed is the one who remains steadfast in the trial, for when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life, which God promises to those who, finish it, love him. And remember I said the re- what's being tested is, do you love him? And when we wait quietly for him, confidently for him, we're saying, Lord, we love you, we trust you. We're not going to let this get us cranky. And finally, James would say, wait in confidence. And I might add another fill in the blank here. Wait in confident prayer. Micah 7, but as for me, I'll look to the Lord. I'll wait for the Lord, my salvation, because my God will hear me. See, he'll hear me. It's talking about prayer. James 5, 13 to 18, it's not in your outline, but it's all about prayer. A year ago, I preached on James 5, 13 to 18 when we talked about a prayer for healing. We had a healing time after church. James says that the way we weigh in confidence is by being steadfast in prayer. When you find your, 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 your waiting is, is getting weak, prayer is the way to, to, to remain steadfast. Psalm 37, be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Be still. Psalm 46, be still and know I'm God and you're not. Okay, that's not the Bible, that's me. But it's the same essence. Be still and know that I'm God and you're not and you don't have to be. Stop striving, stop sweating, stop being a nervous nilly. I love Exodus 14. The Israelites backwards to the Red Sea, the Egyptians are closing in and Moses lifts up the rod to part the Red Sea, and this is what Moses says, the Lord will fight for you. You just be quiet. Just be silent. Just watch. This is what I would imagine God was saying at the cross. Just watch me fight for you. Just be still, be quiet. Praying for patience. When things are uncontrollable, when people are unchangeable, when things are unexplainable, praying for patience because our patient waiting honors him. That we trust he's not done yet. I close with this story. There were two men that went into a museum and they looked at a painting called Checkmate. Checkmate, if if you play chess. One of the men happened to be a chess champion And they looked at it for a while, and there's the one man sitting at the table, and he's playing chess with the devil. And for those who would look at it, it seems to be that the devil has won, and he's smirking and smiling. The men stood at it for a long time, and finally the one man became impatient, and he moved on to other paintings. But the chess champion continued to look at the painting, and then it hit him. Then he knew there was something wrong with the painting. And he went up to his friend, and he said, you've got to see this, you've got to look at this. They're either going to have to change the name of the painting or they're going to have to change the painting. He says, because if you look at it, he says, the king still has one move. When you get impatient, when you think nothing can happen or change in a person or in your life, remember this, the king still has the last move. The king still has one more move. That's his M.O. throughout. When people's backs were to the wall, like the Israelites to the Red Sea, just be quiet and watch. The king has one more move, and it's a doozy. And that's the hope we have when we wait. In Jesus' name, amen.